Welcome to my channel, my name is Josh Christian, and today I wanna to talk a little bit about AI, or more specifically, what the future of programming is gonna look like heading forward. I really don't think most programmers have anything to worry about or that they're gonna be replaced or anything like that, but I do think that the tools are going to change and the way we as programmers use those tools is going to drastically shift. So that's what I wanna talk a little bit about today. Let's get started. So the first topic I should probably address is sort of this common sense outlook that I have, and that's chat GPT, as of right now, Gemini, all the other different ones, uh, being AI, they could easily replace every writer in the world. When we talk about fictional writers, when we talk about editors, if you're talking about publication houses, if you're talking about Hollywood writers and editors, script writers, all of these people could very, very easily be replaced by AI. In fact, we're talking about several million jobs instantly could be replaced tomorrow by AI successfully. AI would do a good job. It would actually make less grammatical errors. It would probably be a better editor. And yet it hasn't replaced anyone yet. I have not seen any legitimate cases yet of AI replacing professional writers, not even journalists. Now we do see new websites popping up all around the internet where you can see very clearly the articles are written by AI. They're perfect in terms of the technical writing, but the context is just so sterile, it's so inhuman. And I'm not saying that AI won't get better at those things, of course it will, it'll improve and get better, but my point is that it would be pretty easy to be able to just hire one guy that knows how to use AI well and replace 100 writers. But we don't see any of the publication houses doing that. They all have pretty much retained their standard writers. Very few have done any layoffs at all despite the advent of AI kind of coming out of nowhere. So I guess the question we have to ask ourselves is, why haven't the publishing houses in Hollywood replaced writers yet? If AI easily can, why hasn't it? And the answer to that, of course, is very obvious. Humans have this incredible ability to understand and assess context. Now, again, I'm not saying that AI won't get better at that. Of course it will. But humans have this ingenuity to them. They have this sense of artistic desire to do something unique or different. And the problem with AI is that even as it gets better, even as context becomes very, very clear and it gets extremely good at handling very complicated human topics and interactions, it's still gonna fail somewhere. And that failure is going to be very similar to what we're seeing in music production. If we go back to the 1970s, especially when we're talking about music here, people had to record everything on tape. Now, if you don't know anything about tape, it's not like digital where they can just do unlimited takes until you get a perfect take. They had a finite amount of tape for every different performance, whether it was the drums, whether it was the guitars or the vocals. So you would do as many performances as you, as you could within the realm of, you know, this is how much feet of tape we have. So guitarists often would be limited in the 1970s to doing like 30 or 40 takes and just doing the best that they could. And we see this with Sweet Home Alabama. Go listen to it. It's slightly off time. The actual main lead guitar part is not perfectly on. It drifts in and out a little bit. But that's also what makes that song so great. It would sound like a computer. It would sound sterile and dry and bland without that slight sense of groove, as we call it in the music industry. That exact same thing that we're talking about in music translates perfectly to writing. There has to be a sense of humanity. There has to be those slight imperfections that make it natural, that make it real. And when you lose that, you end up with EDM music, right? Now, of course, there's a place for perfection. There's a place in EDM music and electronic music where everything's quantized perfectly and has that robotic tone. But for the most part, most people want things to sound human. And we would lose that in writing the same way we lost it in music. My point here in saying all this is that the human spirit can't be undermined. It's an essential element to writing. And that's why writers aren't being replaced. Now you might say, okay, but programming is different. Programming is about perfection. It's about being robotic. We don't need human ingenuity there. And to some degree you might be right, but sometimes you have to think out of the box. Sometimes you have to solve problems that haven't really been solved before. Or sometimes you want to do something that is more artistic, that is more interesting, or maybe doesn't work in a perfect way. And when we run into those problems, Naturally, AI is just not gonna be able to do it because it's gonna be designed too perfectly. It's gonna be designed to work, not necessarily to innovate. And innovation in engineering is what continues to push technology forward. So no, you can't just replace all programmers with AI. 
but those AI tools are extremely useful in helping programmers move forward faster in their work, come up with solutions quicker. And ultimately, I think that we're going to see AI getting integrated into the development environments. And later, I'm going to talk a little bit about that in this video. But my point is just saying you can kind of use this time to get ahead of the curve. As long as you're a step ahead, as long as you know how to use the new tools coming out and how those tools will adapt to your changing workflow, I do think that you can future-proof your job and be stable in the coming future, not have to worry so much about being replaced. So now I want to talk a little bit about how I think AI is going to be used sort of as just another layer of abstraction. So if you don't know what an abstraction is, think about a computer processing chip. So a central processing chip, the CPU of your computer. It talks to all of the other components in the motherboard, connected to the motherboard, using zero and five volts. Now today it's not necessarily five volts, but that's not really the point. The point is there's no voltage and then there's voltage. In most cases, historically, it was zero and five volts. Now, very quickly pulsing zero and five volts, you'd be amazed how much information can pass. In fact, that's how GPUs work. Basically, you have a computer processing chip that's sending signals very, very, very quickly using just electrical pulses. Now, the zero volts in the binary world is zero, and the five volts is one. So when you write binary or machine code, there's a direct correlation between those zeros and ones that you're writing, or that the computer's writing, into zero and five volts that the computer processing chip is using to speak to all the different components and actually do things. Whether it's lighting up your screen and putting colors on the screen so you can play a video game, or just processing logic, it's all zero and five volts at the end of the day. So really, everything other than zero and five volts is a layer of abstraction to make programming easier. So we have kind of binary at the bottom of this pyramid. Now, you wouldn't really want to program in binary. If you've ever actually written machine code, you would know it's possible to write very simple programs in binary, but it would basically take hundreds of millions of lines of code to do anything even remotely useful. So people at some point had to take that and say, you know what, let's abstract that outwards and upwards. And that's where assemblers come in. So as we move up from binary, we head towards more human readable languages. And the higher in that pyramid we go, the easier it gets for a human to understand exactly what's happening. It's sort of getting closer to human speech, like what we're doing right now. I'm talking, you're listening, you understand me. You have basically the first human understandable language in assemblers. Now, you could look at that and think, okay, why didn't we just stop there? It would make sense. Assembly, if you actually go learn it, is very easy to learn. It's very easy to use. But as you want to do more and more complex things, you have to use really an extreme amount of code. You know, it gets just so heavy. There's no shorthanded way of doing anything. And that's what handles are. Handles would be something like a library or a framework. It's this idea that I don't actually have to write everything myself. The wheel has already been invented. I don't need to reinvent the wheel. So by having handles, let's say I'm making an audio plugin, I don't have to literally recode all of the connection ports coming in from the audio interface and how all of that will get processed on screen. All of that's already handled for me within sound libraries and frameworks and things that have already been built by people much smarter than me to make it more convenient to program those things. So as we go up past assemblers, we hit C and C++ languages similar to that. Of course, there's many different examples, but I think those are good examples of sort of higher level languages. Now, the irony is we actually call those low level languages today because when we compare it to something like uh, JavaScript or Python, that's actually very low level by comparison. But in the day when C was created, we actually called that a high level programming language because it's much higher level than binary, for example, or even assemblers. So C and C++ are actually far far more complex tools than assemblers. Even though assemblers are so much easier to learn, they're so much harder to do anything useful with. Eventually, people kind of came to the conclusion that they need to abstract C and C++ even more because tools like ARC, uh, automatic reference counting, and garbage collection came out, and companies wanted to basically ditch manual memory management. So the new idea was, okay, well, we could actually build systems where the compiler handles all memory management by itself. And again, that was just another layer of abstraction. It made programming for programmers like you and me much, much easier. That's why Python is so much easier to make things with 
than, for example, C and C++. Now, the caveat to moving up this pyramid is that as these languages get easier to use, the tools get more complex, which also means they get much more bloated. Now, that bloat tends to kind of slow everything down. And not only are these languages bloated and slow to compile or interpret, but they're very, very non-performant. If you actually write that Photoshop clone in assemblers, you can very clearly pinpoint the performance flaws. You can go in and figure out exactly where you can optimize performance and make it run and load and do you know, actions much faster. But if you were to program that Photoshop clone in Python, so much is inferred by the compiler or interpreter automatically that you get just so much less control over performance. And you're gonna end up with a very, very poor performing application. And for that reason, most games and heavy software today is written in C or C++, or in many cases, even assembly. In fact, a very good example of this would be Photoshop itself. Photoshop is actually written in C and assemblers. And the reason for that is very, very simple. Adobe knew that performance for professionals would matter. So they wanted the fastest, most optimized software that they could make. And for me as a programmer, I guess that kind of explains why I'm so turned off by any software that runs in a browser. If it's running in your browser and it's based on Python or JavaScript, it's just slow, at least for professional use. Whenever I use photo or video editors or AI tools or art tools that run in the browser, they just seem so much slower than actual core software that was built in assemblers. So all of this kind of goes as far as to just justify my point that as you move up that triangle of hierarchy, things really start to slow down. Yeah, things get easier. Yeah, you can hire cheaper labor, not pay people as much. Yeah, they take less training and you can pull them straight out of college and they don't need as much experience, but they also have so much less control of what's happening. And ultimately, I think that's a big part of why software today is getting so slow. Look how sluggish software is becoming. Hopefully I'm not the only person noticing that, but it seems like every new piece of software just gets slower and slower. Not to mention they're probably collecting all your data and sending that to the government. And that kind of has the nature to slow things down as well, I'm sure. So in my view, that pyramid is being extended by AI. Gone are the days of simpler languages, getting simpler and simpler and simpler. That point, that top of that pyramid is going to be AI tools. So the first real useful application of AI into the workflow of programmers, in my opinion, is going to be integration into IDEs. Let me just give you kind of a example here, an overview of how you could improve your workflow using AI. So let's say JetBrains or Visual Studio or Xcode started integrating AI tools to sort of help you with autocomplete. So how that would look would probably be something along the lines of your programming and the systems analyzing the code or the statement that you're writing and it figures out, oh, this person, this program is trying to do this. And it gives you options to autocomplete whatever you're trying to do that are much more advanced and intelligent than what's been available in the past. Now, autocomplete as of right now is pretty good, but imagine if we had actual contextual AI that could help you better point to the framework you're trying to use. The AI's context could jump in and say, oh, I see you're trying to use this framework, but you're using it wrong. You're calling that function incorrectly. This is what you're actually trying to do, and it would point you in the right direction. I could see tools like that greatly, greatly improving the performance of individual programmers. Instead of a program taking you 10 hours to write, it might only take you two or three hours. And that time saved will ultimately mean that companies have to hire less programmers. Now that doesn't mean companies are just gonna start firing everybody right away, but as those tools develop and get better, I do think programmers need to sort of change and adapt their skill set to being more abstracted because the industry is sort of already oversaturated and we have too many people going into white collar fields, not enough people going to college for blue collar fields or going to trade schools. We probably are going to see things sort of meet equilibrium eventually, but until then I do think hiring is gonna to continue to slow down because as these tools come out and people become more performant, naturally companies and especially startups are going to need less programmers. Although I do think that senior developers are probably going to be safe because they still understand the architecture and direction that software has to be developed in that maybe junior developers don't understand. And that ultimately is gonna be the most important aspect of being a programmer in the future where AI can help you actually write the code. So my perspective is that we really need to stop thinking about AI as sort of this magical do-all tool that's gonna replace every programmer. And we need to really refocus our attention on it as the next layer or level of abstraction in the world of programming. When Python first came out, 
there was a lot of people that were worried that as languages become simpler and easier to use, eventually they would be so simple that anybody could use it and it would just replace programmers as a profession. But obviously that didn't happen because the complexities of building software go much deeper than the complexities of the syntax of the language you're using. And because of that, really not much changed when Python came out. It became easier to get into tech. It became easier to teach in colleges. Maybe more people uh, were less daunted by the task of learning how to program, but it's not changing the way we make software. And AI is going to be the same situation. It's gonna be another layer of abstraction, making it easier, making it simpler for people to understand and get into. But the core way, the fundamental structure of how we build software is probably not going to change very much. So I'll leave with this point here. My perspective is that the future of all programming is a big black box. That's it. It's a big black box that sits on your desk. You go up to that box and you say, I want to make a program. Here's the type of program I want to make. Make the program do this, make it do that, make it look different. Build this visual interface this way. That's my general concept of what the future is going to look like. And that in a nutshell is why I think programmers probably won't be replaced anytime soon, because you'll always need somebody sitting there in front of the box telling it what to do. Though their title might change. Maybe they won't be called programmers anymore. Maybe they'll be called program designers or something of that nature. But somebody from a human experience with a human perspective is always going to be there telling that computer what to do next. So as programmers working in the tech industry, let's worry less about being replaced by these new coming amazing future tools and let's worry more about using those tools to make ourselves irreplaceable. Thank you so much for watching. I really do appreciate every viewer, especially if you made it to the end here. Don't forget to like and subscribe down below and share this video with your friends and family. I've got a lot more videos like this coming in the future. See you on the next one.